is uh, setting up the laptop. So I would have heard about Gord when I was in university because Gord was part of a wonderful church in Waterloo where I was, I was studying at Wilfrid Laurier University, the small school there. And uh, Gord was part of a church called Lincoln Road Chapel, uh, which had planted a bunch of different churches uh, around the area. And um, he and his friend Jay Gurnett and others had been blessing the city of Kitchener-Waterloo uh, with their church planting and church leadership. And uh, when I came to Mosaic and learned about Mosaic and learned that we were part of Vision Ministries Canada, I ran into Gord again because Gord is one of the founding directors of Vision Ministries Canada, which is the, the network of churches that we're a part of. And Gord is a man who I believe uh, he exemplifies the kinds of things that uh, God has called all of us to walk in. When we talk about Mosaic Intercultural Church, one of the reasons why Mosaic Intercultural Church can exist in a network of brethren churches is because our brother Gord Martin and others like him, other leaders in, in the network, are phenomenal at loving people from all different backgrounds. And Gord has built trust and, and empowered leaders of churches, leaders who are coming from many different nations of the world. He has uh, traveled to Kenya on multiple occasions to strengthen the church in Kenya. And he has been uh, a wonderful leader and support to us here at Mosaic. So even though this is the first time he's, he's speaking here, Gord, it's a pleasure to have you. And we are excited to see what the Lord has to speak to us through you. So let's pray for you and then come and share the word. So Father, would you bless your servant Gord, who is our brother because of Jesus? Would you bless him with joy and power in the Holy Spirit as he shares with us today? And God, we pray that you prepare our hearts for what you want to speak to us. Would we be faithful and obedient to what you say? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. It's very good to be with you today. We can hardly escape the fact that in this passage that we have read this morning, it's about being sent out two by two. Can we ignore that? It's really in the middle of the passage. And I'm wondering how delighted, you, how many of you have ever done door-to-door -door work of some kind? How many of you have done that? Oh, okay. So this, how many of you would like to do it today? <laughs> I remember the, very well the first time that I was asked to do this. The church that I grew up in was having what they called drive-in services so that in the summer they would set up like a drive-in theater except it was drive-in church. And I was 18 years old and I had just recently seriously committed my life to Christ. And I was beginning to teach Sunday school and wouldn't you know it, we had a man in our church who was very bold and uh, he wanted to recruit people from the church to go from door to door in Elmira, the town that I went to high school in, to invite people to come to the drive-in service. And he asked me, and I can't tell you how badly I wanted to say no. In fact, I just wanted to hide. But I had just begun to teach Sunday school and I had made this commitment. Bob, what a surprise. <laughs> uh, I had just made this commitment to Christ. I was now the, the surprise, surprise, the leader of the youth group in my home church. And he asked, would I like to come? And he had this big smile on his face and I can't imagine that I had any smile on mine. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't know how to say no, and so uh, I went, and, uh, and I was secretly praying that some of the people that I knew in Elmira would not be home that day, and the Lord heard my cry. I don't recall that any of them were home, but it was <laughs> my introduction to what is talked about in this passage about Jesus sending out his disciples. Now, of course, we might wonder, like, a, this doesn't mean you guys, does it? No, 
course not. Uh, but it turns out that what I was so afraid to do as an 18-year-old, I ended up volunteering for for a huge chunk of my life. So I think that I have probably modestly knocked on about 70 or 80,000 doors in my lifetime to talk to people. And uh, now it's not something I've done for a while now, but I just wanted to warm you up to the text because we're not just talking about something that's in the Bible. You know, sometimes we read the Bible and we say, like this was for them and not for us, right? So what are we going to do with this? And as we come to this text, I would like us to, I know we already had it read to us, but I would like us to read it out loud and read it out loud strong together, all right? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. He who listens to you, listens to me. He who rejects you, rejects me. But he who rejects me, sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. This is a very complicated looking page, but I only want you to notice one thing, really, that this account, what happened right here in the life of Jesus, happened towards the end of his life. And the high point had come earlier. When Jesus was the most popular, that time was behind him. Now there was resistance. And although at the beginning there was this swell of interest, people were being healed and people were flooding to hear him from everywhere, now people were beginning to balk and they were saying, we're not so sure. And Jesus had said some very hard things in the chapter just prior to the one that we're looking at this morning. So this is what we're calling the later Galilean period. And we're coming towards the end of his earthly life, which was really the climax of his life. So that we might think that when Jesus was the most popular, that was the climax. But not so. The climax is really, when, it, when you read each of the four Gospels, you discover that the climax comes at the end where Jesus is crucified and is raised from the dead. That is really the high point of all four Gospels. So I just wanted you to notice that this is happening later. There's only a few months to go. And it says in chapter 9, verse 51, and some of our translations differ a little bit, but I love this verse. Some of our translations say that Jesus resolutely went to Jerusalem. Or the old authorized version said that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So that everything else that had happened, most of it was in Galilee, uh, kind of that out of the way place. But now he is determined to go to Jerusalem. So everything else that has been going on, all of the preaching, the teaching, the people that were following him, calming the sea, 
All those things were behind him. And now it's time. And he knew that his time was coming for the climax of his life. That's the time that was coming. You know, sending people was primary for Jesus. This wasn't something that was uh, just kind of in a corner of his ministry. This was actually a primary activity of his life. It says earlier in the Gospel of Luke that he chose 12 to be apostles. Now, apostles can be, um, well, a name of to be esteemed. If somebody is an apostle, if we call somebody an apostle today, we think, wow, this is an apostle. But the word apostle means sent. It's not a term of status. It's a word that expresses obedience. These were 12 people that Jesus chose to be with him. And they were going to be sent as messengers. Not sent for just anything. They were sent as messengers. He sent the 12 in chapter 9 individually to preach and to heal. That's one of the differences between this section that we're looking at today and chapter 9. Here, they're sent out two by two. In chapter 9, they're sent out individually to do pretty much the same thing, to preach and to heal. We're going to come back to that. Here, he sends the 72 to tell and to heal. And he's sending them to all of the towns and villages that he hasn't been to yet. Later on, at the very end of Jesus' life, after his resurrection, he said to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. I just want you to notice that sending is a big part of this uh, life of Jesus. You will be my witnesses, it says in Acts 1.8. Telling people about me everywhere, from Jerusalem, Judea, to the uttermost part of the world, or to people everywhere. I just want you to notice that being sent is a regular part of what Jesus came to, to do and to accomplish. Acts chapter 8. But the believers who were scattered, scattered because of persecution and violence, that's why they were scattered, preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. So this kind of being sent, this kind of people going out everywhere with a message, with good news, with something to say, is a big piece of what we're talking about here. So, Coming back to the passage, after this, after those heavy words about counting the cost in chapter 9, the Lord appointed 72 others and he sent them out two by two. Now, why two by two? We could have an interesting little conversation right here about that. Uh, but somehow, I think that, would you rather go two by two or just alone? <laughs> There's some moral support when we go two by two. And uh, if I run out of something to say, my partner can chip in. He sent them to every town. It was a part of a larger strategy. strategy. It was very deliberate what Jesus was doing. He was moving from where he was to Jerusalem where he was going to die. But on the way, he was going to be speaking in towns and villages all the way. And he send, sends out these messengers, these 72. Now, do we have 72 here this morning? What if we all went? One, two, three, four, five. We might not have quite 72, but we'd be getting there. And I just would like us to think that I'd like you to feel what it was like because we could be a part of that group of 72 that are sent two by two. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know what? Why don't we just pray? Would you stand with me right here? And uh, because it would be a shame to read through this verse and gloss over this and not stop to do what Jesus asked us to do. Heavenly Father, the harvest is plentiful all around the world, but the workers seem to be few. So Lord, we're asking would you send out workers into this big harvest? Amen. 
even from here. We ask it in Jesus' great name. Amen. You may be seated. He says, there will be danger. I love it when there are people full of courage and not afraid of the danger. And one of my favorite memories of this is in being in a slum in Nairobi. And we were with a couple of, I think I was visiting this church by myself that day, come to think of it. And uh, several things stand out in my mind. The keyboard was not working that day. And so the worship leader said, you know, before the Lord gave us keyboards, he gave us hands. He began to clap. And the people sang. But what I understood, that this little church at the bottom of a slope by a, a, a river that was terribly contaminated, that's the place where most of the murders and the rapes took place. And they, these people decided that they would put up a great light. And they erected a huge pole and a big light on top, and they cleared away all the garbage and the brush, and they built a church there. It's no longer the place where the murders and rapes are happening. Isn't that good? There might be danger. But danger for us here in Canada is pretty slight. The danger here is that somebody might just kind of look at us with a dismissive glance or might just say, actually, we're not interested. That would be the, almost the biggest danger we could encounter here. But when Jesus was sending out his people, these disciples, these 72 Oh no, there was real danger, and there has been real danger all around the world where this message has gone. Don't take a purse. You don't need anything. I love the idea of traveling light. You know, if you have to pack, you have all kinds of things to be worried about. Uh, what is going to happen when we go to the first house or to the first door and while you're packing, you might say, I have more time to think about this and maybe I'm not going to go after all. <laughs> go, he says to them. It's immediate. He's telling them to go and he's telling them where to go and he, as he does that, he says, when you enter a house, say, Peace to this house. He's saying something good to them. If you went to a house, even if it was right beside your house, and, and if you said to the people living there whose names you already know, but even if you just went next door and said, peace to this house. My wife is exceptional at this. Uh, Several years ago, a number of years ago now, but it's continued since, she decided that before Lent, she would do something extra. And she decided that she would bless a household every day for every day leading up to Easter. So it turned, by the time she thought of it, it was she had 22 days to go. And so every day, she went either to a house or wrote a note or left a message on their phone or gave them cookies. She did something to bless. One of them was a man, a grandfather. And she left a message on his phone. And my wife knows how to leave a message. <laughs> she left a message on his phone and she said, you know, I just want you to know how impressed I have been by the way you have been there for your children and for your grandchildren. You are a great grandfather. She met him a couple of days later, and he said to her, 
that message couldn't have come at a better time. I just brought our grandkids home. They threw up all over the back seat of my car. And when I got home, here was this message from you. The Bible says, bless and do not curse. People around us today are not used to hearing the word bless. They're maybe somewhat accustomed to hearing peace. But bless is not as familiar as curse. And so when you enter a house, say peace. This little campaign that was going on, it begins very gently. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. You don't have to be pushy. So that if you go to this house and you say, peace be on this house, and the person says, well, thank you. They've received that word of peace from you. If not, it will return to you. It won't disappear from you. <laughs> you will still have it to give to the next house. You don't have to be pushy. Sometimes when we have talked about going from house to house, we've kind of assumed that a sort of aggressiveness is necessary. It's not. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house. It assumes a kind of hospitality that is quite different from ours. Um, when my wife and I were first married, we, I say we honeymooned in the tropics. Uh, we moved to Ecuador, and we did a lot of door-to-door -door work and church planting. And... Uh, the poorest people, when we came to their house many times, the mother would say to one of her children, run to the store and get a, a pop for this. And, you know, I felt kind of, kind of taken aback at the hospitality that we were shown. And this assumes a level of hospitality that is quite different from Canadian hospitality. People were open. If you came to their house, it was expected. We have to sort of explain this because this is alien for us. But it's still the case in large parts of the world where hospitality is practiced in a way that is quite different than it is for us. Whatever they give you, we may think, well, I don't, want to have, I don't want to take this. But he said, I'm sending you. You deserve it. <laughs> if they are hospitable to you, receive what they offer you. Don't move around. He wanted them to have, he didn't want them to be in everybody's house and start rumors and that kind of thing. Just stay in one house. And when you enter a town and you are welcomed, eat what is set before you. It's not about your preferences. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in a house in Mississauga, and the, among other things, there was cow foot soup. You know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> you like it? It's pretty good. I give it a 7.5. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many other people have had cow foot soup? So this was my first opportunity. So anyway, I said yes. I could tell when I'd eaten for about two days afterwards, actually. But, um, but when you go to somebody's house or go to a town, just accept what is given you, even if it seems strange, because uh, I could definitely tell from the shape of it what it was. And uh, <laughs> it's not about your preferences. This is a, what you like or don't like is a small item. Uh, we are... Messengers, heal the sick and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. This is your business. This is why you're going to the house. This is of greatest importance. Tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. And heal the sick. I want to come back to this in a minute. 
then there follows some severe warnings about people or towns who won't listen to you. He who listens to you listens to me. You are my, when you go to this house, you're not just being you. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph. You're not just Joseph. You're going to that house as a representative of Jesus. A representative of God just stepped up in front of the door. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Don't take it personally. It's not you that they're rejecting. So the 72 came back. It doesn't tell us anything. I mean, I would really like to know all the stories of what happened <laughs> when they went from house to house and village to village. It says nothing about that, only this. They came back and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. I mean, this was a big thing that happened. But he said, I saw Satan. Only he saw it. Nobody else saw this. But he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This was the, something big had happened here. This is the beginning of many such things to come. I have given you authority to trample on snakes. Now, so what about this? We have a snake handler here. When we come to this passage, this is an invitation to us to be fearless and bold. It doesn't say which snake might bite you, will you ever get bitten, or is this a, is this a, a guarantee that no snake bite will ever harm you? It doesn't precisely say that. Well, it does, kind of. We're called to be fearless. Uh, during the pandemic, I wrote a book. It's my life story, and it's called Doing It Afraid. I called it that because I realized that at this stage of my life, I'm kind of getting to know a lot of people who don't think I'm afraid <laughs> of anything, but it's never been true. I've always been afraid. Still am afraid and inadequate for all kinds of things that come my way. Whether it's snakes or scorpions, nothing will harm you. We're to go. Now, does that mean we should bring up a basket of snakes and I'll just prove it to you on the spot? We could have a discussion about that. <laughs> the point is that we are called to be obedient, called to be bold, called to do what he tells us to do. He said to them, as far as demons being subject to you, don't rejoice in that. Don't get carried away with what you are doing. Always remember that what really matters is that your names are written in heaven. This is actually the big thing. Yes, you're called to be obedient. Yes, you're called to be messengers. But let it be that your primary joy is that your name is written in heaven. He knows your name. You belong to him. You are his. He cares about you. He loves you. The work, yes, is important. But don't ever let it become more important than the reality that he knows you. Now, these are two things that should go together, speaking and healing. We may be afraid of both of them, speaking and healing. And I know that in our time right here in Canada, there are some people who believe strongly in speaking the message of good news and others believe strongly in healing or doing good deeds of all kinds, 
but they prefer not to have to speak unless it's really, really, really obvious that they should speak. These two things go together in the instruction of Jesus. A readiness to speak and a readiness to heal. To speak because the kingdom of God is near. When he says that, what does it mean? And it seems to me that there are brushes. The kingdom of God can kind of come near and brush against somebody. That it's not something obvious. It's not something that could be seen. But many times you will find that people will say that they are spiritual. Maybe they're spiritual and not religious. When you hear somebody saying that, it's kind of like the kingdom of God is sort of brushed near. <laughs> because they know that there is something more than what you can see. Driving down here this morning the back way from Waterloo was just a beautiful drive. Beautiful. And you look at it and say, this is so beautiful. It almost dares you. Not to say, this is so beautiful that it feels almost mystical. And when that happens, it's the kingdom of God that is near. It's just brushed close. And so to be able to say the kingdom of God is near, that it's not about religion or church. There's quite a lot of people in our country that are quite resistant to what they would call religion or church. It is about Jesus, the Emmanuel, the one who is God with us. That's who we are talking about. That's what the message is about. It's about him. So that when we hear people talking in sort of mystical tones, we can say, you know what that is? That's the kingdom of God near. And what can bring that even closer is the words of Jesus. For us to be able to talk, to say peace to this house, blessings on this house, and they say, well, thank you. And uh, so I've never heard, nobody has ever said this to me before, blessing. <laughs> and uh, so on one of the occasions when my wife was going to this house, she was going to drop a note into the mailbox. But as she was approaching the front door, the garage door opened up. And suddenly the woman who lived there was standing right in front of, so Heather had to sort of change of plans and uh, explain why she was there, why she was walking up her driveway. She said, this is so and said that she just had experienced that day or that week crisis in her home. It's quite astonishing what can happen. Just blessing people. The kingdom of God is near. It is about Jesus. That it is about him. It's not about religion or church. We can get into all kinds of debates about this uh, with just about anyone, anywhere. And I've had lots of these kind of conversations. And somebody has said to me, well, I gave up church, you know, when I missed a few times. Uh, or I was sick and I was away. They began to send offering envelopes to our house. I've never gone back. So I've heard that numerous times. People can have all kinds of reasons to be resistant to church or religion. But I just want to encourage you to say this is about a message concerning the kingdom of God. That kingdom where God reigns. That place where he is in charge. There's a whole big parts of the world that are not like that. That are in violence and in trouble. But when the kingdom of God is near, it's about Jesus. And healing. Healing is about healing. But it's also about a lot more than that. And I would say 
is there trouble? We used to sing a song when I was a kid. Is there trouble anywhere? <laughs> well, of course there is trouble everywhere. And then the song went on to say, we should never be discouraged. There is a lot of people in trouble and in pain. Lots of people are angry and in conflict. And I say, that's exactly the place to go. The place where there is trouble is the place where we ought to go because we are bearers of good news. We are bearers of the kingdom news about the kingdom of God. We are bearers of this message about Jesus. And many people, I've read those gospels so many times that I said, God, if you could heal a bunch of people this week, it would make speaking a lot easier. I think it works this way that Jesus calls us to do what he tells us to do. To go, to bring this message of good news to our neighborhood, to our community, to the people that we know. And we, is there trouble? Go where the trouble is. When people have no trouble, they're fine. <laughs> but when there's trouble anywhere, and we might say, well, I don't feel adequate for that. Well, of course, you're not. But you're not going alone. You are going. Didn't we say when we were reciting that Nicene Creed that I believe in the Holy Spirit? Didn't we, weren't we saying something like that? That we're not going alone. That wherever we go, he is with us. Help them. If you pray and they are healed immediately, praise and glory to God. If they are not, help them with whatever you can. If you help them because they don't have money, you help them because they're in trouble, you help them because they're in conflict, you help them because they're mad or sad. Whatever you help them with will open the door to the next part. I've come home many times from meeting with people and said to my wife, I can't believe what I'm getting to say to some of these people. <laughs> because if you help them with the problems they know they have, and if you love them, sooner or later you can tell them almost anything. They may not be receptive at the beginning, but as you love them and help them and keep going to people, not just three or four or five, just keep on doing it, you will find that there are people who are responsive. And by the way, as you are in motion, you will be astonished at what God will do. I thought at the beginning, just give me a handful of miracles to get started with, <laughs> to kind of prime the pump. But what I found instead is that as I go, as I go to the places that I feel and am inadequate for, he will meet me along the way. And testimonies of the goodness and the power of God emerge from that kind of obedience. Now, this passage that we are looking at this morning is one little section in the middle of a whole big, huge plan of God. And this year, I have been more aware of trouble and violence and war in the world than ever before. Uh, what time is it? What, what time do you normally finish here? Finish. <laughs> Are you that relaxed about this? <laughs> this year uh, has been a year of violence. Uh, I have been on a phone call every Friday morning for two years to pray for a friend and brother in Burma who was locked down because of the pandemic and because of war. And he would say to us at times, he called the bombs and the shelling noise in the night. But one day he said, you know, I could hardly sleep last night. It was so quiet. 
the dangerous place. So we were praying for him. And just about two weeks ago, he, he escaped to India. Uh, it's, we're just hugely relieved, but so aware of trouble and violence. A couple of other people in, on the prayer group are from Ethiopia and Eritrea. Well, there's a big war going on there. And so we were praying about that. And then we had Ukraine and Russia, and these are just kind of big ones. What is God doing? The Bible tells us that before time, he planned, he created, but there's rebellion, rebellion in people, and we see it all around the world today. And the big news is redemption. Sometimes when we watch a movie, we ask ourselves, is there any redeeming value to this movie? <laughs> is there anything good, anything wholesome coming out of this? Because a lot of them have nothing wholesome in them. But redemption or redeeming is what God has been about from the beginning of time, is to heal and to bring back and to restore. And that ultimately there's going to be a new creation. So that's the story of the Bible. <laughs> but a little more detail. It begins with, not quite begins, but almost with Abraham. That all of the nations would be blessed through him. A huge promise is given to him. And then to Israel, that they would become a light to the nations, but they were not a very good light. And I've been reading the prophets for these last couple of years, and oh my goodness, the prophets spoke to them and urged them and poured out the passion of God to those people. They didn't listen. Jesus came. That's what we're reading about today. The light of the world. And he says to us, in the same way that God sent him, he's sending us. And he's going to make all things new. I just want us to realize that this passage that we're reading this morning is not just clump, a little clump of verses that you can read without understanding what has all come before and what's all coming afterwards, and that we are a part of something big that God is doing. He invites us to be a part of that. We've heard about the Me Too movement. <laughs> what about us? Could there be a Me Too movement here? Could we say, God, you sent out those 72 You scattered the Christians in Acts chapter 8 all around the world today. People are responding. People are stepping onto that path of God's choosing, are finding a way to extend the kingdom of God to being a part of what God is doing. I so wonder. What could happen? There's more than 12 here. And Jesus sent out just 12 to start with. There's not quite 72. But I wonder, what if we were to say, what if we didn't just say, what was it about this morning? Oh, we did Luke 10. <laughs> we didn't do Luke 10 until we Obey Luke 10. And I wonder, what does God have for you? What is he saying to you this morning? Scary? I hope so. Why don't you come? Let's, let's pray, and then you're going to come and just uh, work with us a little bit on this, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for your great mercy and your faithfulness. Thank you that you call us to walk in your footsteps. Father, open our